Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Scott. Beautiful song. Amen. Amen. Reminds us that quiet place where we need to spend some time and listening to Christ. It's great to see all of you here today. It's a beautiful weather outside. Amen. We, we love Calgary in January. <laughs> I never thought I'm going to say that, ever. <laughs> But it's been amazing. December and January has been great. So we'll be paying later in February and March and April maybe. But, uh, you know, we'll take that. Thank you for being here. And uh, today my sermon is entitled, Well Done, My Faithful Servant. And as you remember last time, if you were here, January, we started the month, the first month of this new year with the theme of faithfulness. We talked last time during the communion about being faithful in taking the communion and participating and how we renew our covenant with God, which means we're being faithful to Him um, through communion. And today, I want to preach about being a faithful servant to God. Uh, as I told Terry, he already mentioned a few things I'm going to mention in the sermon, but it's like a tag team, all right? So we, we're just going to continue on, on the same theme. Stewardship is managing wisely what God has given to us. Amen? Is there anything that you're thankful to God for in the past year that he has given to you? Is there anything that you can say, thank you, Lord? Has he been faithful to you in 2018? And I know for a fact that he's going to continue being faithful to you in 2019. Amen? The question is, are we going to continue being faithful to him in 2019? And that's why we're starting this year with the theme of faithfulness. And you might say, oh, pastor, already the second Sabbath of New Year and you're preaching on stewardship. You know, when we preach on stewardship, some members cringe sometimes and it's an uncomfortable topic. When you go to a doctor for a checkup, he or she will often begin to poke you and sometimes in various places, and while asking, does it hurt? Does it hurt? You guys experience that, right? Um, you know, and then they say, how about here? How about this? Does it hurt? If you cry out in pain, either the doctor has pushed too hard, or more likely, there is something wrong. And the doctor will say, well, we need to do some more tests to find out what's wrong. Because he would tell you it's not supposed supposed to hurt there. So it is the same when the pastor preaches about stewardship. There are some members who would cry out in discomfort. So if you find yourself today while I'm preaching in discomfort and it's hurting, maybe you need to have a talk with your physician. And you know who's your physician, right? The great physician. If it hurts today, it means I push too hard, and I'm not going to apologize for that. No, just kidding. Or maybe there is something wrong there that you need to have a talk with Jesus. You need to go to your great physician and let him heal you and help you become faithful to him in the area of stewardship. But if it doesn't hurt, for those who don't have a problem in this area, today's sermon will just be another reminder of remaining faithful to God. Amen? Amen? We always need reminders. So today I would like to look at the parable of the talents from Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. I want you to open your Bibles there with me. And we're going to stay for the whole sermon in this passage here, Matthew 25. There are so many good principles of faithful stewardship in this passage. We're not going to read the whole passage, but I'm going to quickly remind you, give you a background, uh, summarize the parable as you follow with me in your Bibles. So Jesus is telling a parable, and he says that uh, a rich man, the master, was preparing to leave on a trip, and he did what? He called his servants, and he entrusted his goods to them. To one he gave how many talents? How many? Five. The second one? Two. And the third one? Just one talent. And then he left on the trip, and he asked them to invest that money and, and to bring some return. 
While the master is gone, the five talent and two talent servants invest their money and bring, uh, they, you know, they bring how much back? A hundred percent, right? The one who invested five got five back, and the one who invested two, they, he brought two back. So they brought a hundred percent return. But the one talent guy did what with his talent? He went and buried it. So when the master returns, he commands and rewards the five and two talent servants, but the one talent servant is rebuked and punished. As Christians, we are waiting for our master to come back. Amen? We are waiting for the second coming of Jesus. We are like these servants who are awaiting to return, they return their master. And the main point in this parable is this. We must be faithful to God with what he entrusted to us while he's away and while we are waiting for his return. So what are some principles that we find here in Matthew 25 about stewardship and what we can learn from this parable? There are five principles that I'm going to present to you today. Some of them are very familiar to you. Some of them might not be. But we'll go through these five principles and see what God is telling us, what he's expecting in the area of stewardship from our lives. Verse 14. Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling for a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Principle number one, already was mentioned a few times, everything belongs to whom? To God. The parable is very clear. He gave them whose goods? His goods. Everything belongs to God. You know what? We've been repeating this for so many times, but this is such an important principle to understand. Everything starts with this. If we get this principle that everything belongs to God, we'll never have any problems with stewardship or giving or anything else. We'll never have any problems with with serving others and serving God if we understand this. The job of the servants was to manage what they were given and to manage wisely. Likewise, we must remember that everything belongs to our master, belongs to God. We are told in Psalm 24, verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything is his. Amen? Everything belongs to God. Until we recognize this truth, we will not be good managers of what has been entrusted to us. It's not our time, it's not our money, it's not our abilities, it's not our talents, it is God's. Everything we have is a loan from God. We own nothing. You know, I, I love this story of the elderly woman who went to a grocery store. She finished her shopping. She was walking towards her car in the parking lot with a lot of shopping bags. And uh, she came to her car, and she found four men inside of her car. And the old lady drops the, uh, you know, the shopping bags and drew a handgun from her purse and pointed it at these guys in the car and threatened them to get out of her car. They flew out very quickly out of there. (laughs) Somewhat shaken, she put her gun away, picked up her bags, and got into front seat. But for some reason, the key would not fit the ignition. (laughs) She tried to start the car, but the key would not fit the ignition. Then it dawned on her, this was not her car. It was the wrong car. Her car was in the next row. So she found her car and drove down to the police station to turn herself in. (laughs) As she told her story, the officer behind the desk, who was about ready to fall out of his chair laughing about this, he pointed her to another desk where four men were reporting a carjacking by a little old woman with a handgun. (laughs) 
she thought it was her car. But it really belonged to someone else. We think that we have, what we have is ours. We earned it. We worked for it very hard. It's mine. And sometimes we'll even put a fight for it. Like this old lady, she got a handgun to prove that this is her car. Because we think we are entitled to it. It belongs to me. How many times we put a fight with God for things that don't belong to us? I'm starting with this because this is so important. We must understand this basic principle. Everything belongs to the master. Everything belongs to God. It's not ours. We have been entrusted with it to put it to use for God's good purpose in the world. Amen? It's for his good purpose, not for ours. Don't put a fight with God. Accept it. It belongs to him. That's principle number one. Let's move to the second principle. Verse 15. Matthew 25, verse 15. It says here, And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own what? Ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Second principle is this. God gives to everyone according to his or her own ability. This is an important principle in stewardship. The master gave to one servant five, to another two, and to another one. Now, even though it might seem to us that it's not fair, the master knew how much each servant could handle to us, it would seem that it's not fair that the one gets five, the one gets two, and I just get one. That's not fairness. But God knows how much you can handle. Listen to this. The more it's given to you, the more it will be what? Required from you. <laughs> so don't complain when you have only one talent. Sometimes we're prone to say, oh, Look at those guys in the church that can do this and this and this. They're superstars. And what can I do with one talent? Do we catch ourselves sometimes saying that? Well, let them do it because they have so many talents. I can't use one of mine. If it's given more, it will be required more. God knows how much responsibility each and every one of us can handle. That is why he is fair when he gives to us, to each and every one of us, certain amount of gifts. Our job is not to complain if someone has been given more than us. Our job is to make the most out of what we have been given. Amen? Make the most out of it. Start looking at other people, what God gave them. Focus on only what God has given you. If we cannot be a Moses, we can be an Aaron. <laughs> Aaron was in a supporting role. We can all be Moses to deliver God's people out of slavery and go stand before the Pharaoh. But we can be Aaron. If we can be, uh, you know, gifted as Apostle Paul, you can be among those unnamed saints who ministered to him from their substance. They have never even been named. But they played a very important role in the ministry of the church. Sometimes there are background ministries. And a lot of us like to stand up and be a superstar up front. Not all of us, but some do. If you have been given one, don't think it's insignificant. Because that was the mistake that the third servant made. And we'll come to that. It is important God knew how much you can handle. Even though they all received different amount of talents, the matter of truth is that they all received talents, right? They, all of them were talented. All of them received something. Each of them were uniquely talented. Now, it is true that some of them received more than the others, so we can say that some were more talented than the others, but this is not the reason for the less talented ones not to use their talents. 
The Bible says in Romans 12, 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God deciding who is going to get what. And they know best. God has given you gifts, talents, skills, abilities, you know, personality traits and temperaments and experiences, all to make you who you are, to make you unique. So there is nobody like you. And we want you to show that. There is nobody like you. You are unique. So God can uniquely use you in different areas of ministry. He made you for a specific, unique purpose. Please remember that. Let's move to the third principle of stewardship found in verses 16 to 18. Matthew 25, verse 16 to 18. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Principle number three. Everyone must invest what he or she received. We must invest. I don't know, I'm not sure how many businessmen or women are here that are dealing with investments. But what if you just had some money or sit on them and you don't do anything with them? Is it going to help you? Not much. In the long run, you have to put it into something. You have to invest to gain some return. So, how do we invest this? The purpose of the talents given to us is to use them. And these two servants, the one that received five and the one that received two talents, knew what the master was expecting from them. You know, it doesn't say in the parable that God, the master told them, go and invest my money. The parable doesn't mention that specifically. We find that in a different parable in Luke 19, the parable of Minas, where the master gives them, and then he says, do business till I come, all right? It specifically says there, but here it doesn't. But we see that these two, first two servants immediately knew what they were supposed to do with the money that the master gave them. He, they knew that they were supposed to go and invest that money. They knew that the master didn't just give them the money so they can just go have fun and enjoy their life. They knew the purpose for this money. The purpose was to use the master's good for his benefit, not for their own benefit. Rick Warren, a very famous pastor, says this. <clears throat> I've said that I want the church to put four words on my tombstone. And these are the four words he wants at his tombstone. At least he tried. At least he tried. And then he continues. I may not reach all the goals I believe God has given me for my life, but it really doesn't matter. What matters is the effort, is the trying. Trying to make your life count, trying to make an impact with your life, trying to do something significant that is going to outlast you. It's not whether you reach it or not, it's the effort that counts. Doing nothing is inexcusable. At least you can try. <laughs> And I know there's a lot of members that don't even try. And that's unfortunate. Doing nothing, according to this parable, is inexcusable. And the Lord is very clear in his word. We can try, put some effort, put some time. The Lord wants you to invest what he has given you. And remember, everyone received something. Every one of you here today, you are talented. God has given you a talent. Ask God to show you what is that and use it. Put it to a good use. Let's go to principle number four of stewardship, verse 19. Matthew 25, verse 19, it says here, After a long time, the Lord of those servants did what? Came and settled accounts with them. Principle number four, everyone 
will be accountable for what they have been given. And this is the scary part. When someone comes, wants to settle accounts with you, right? This is the scary part. A day of accountability is coming. None of us want to be audited by the CRA. We don't like that, do we? <laughs> but it happens sometimes. The Bible tells us that all of us will be audited by God. We will have to give an account for how we've used what we've been given. Now, I believe that God is not going to stand in the judgment and say, how many people have you baptized? But I believe that he's going to ask us the question, what have you done with what I've given you? How have you used the talents and abilities I've given you? How did you use them to further God's kingdom? The master had made an investment and he wants a return. God has made an investment in your life and he wants a return from your life. Did he make an investment in your life? Absolutely. He gave his only son for your life. That is the best investment that anyone can make, their own lives. Now he's asking a return. The Bible says that one day God is going to do an audit on our lives. Are you ready for that? God is going to ask you one question. What did you do with what I have given you? Let's move on to principle number five. Let's read verses 20 to 25 from Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, what? Well done, my good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a what? A hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. Principle number five, and this is, very important. What we do with what we have, what we do with what Christ gives us, what we do with what we have, reveals our view of God. And I want you to remember this. We'll spend a few minutes on this principle. The way we use what God has given us really tells how we view God. The first two servants had the proper view of their master. They knew him very well, and that is why they knew what their master expected from them. Unlike the first two servants, the third one didn't know his master. This is what he says in verse 24. Lord, I, what? I knew you to be a hard man. You know, I can't imagine all these three servants standing there and the first two give an account and give back the money. And then I can see the third one coming and say, Lord, I knew you were a hard man reaping where you don't sow. And I can see the shock on the face of the other two guys saying, what are you talking about? We don't know our master that way. How can it happen that two servants have a proper view of the Lord and one has such a misunderstanding of his character and who he really is? Why should we be surprised? Doesn't it happen today the same way? Doesn't it happen the same today? I can ask all of you and you'll tell me a different view of God. Why? Because our view of God is based on our personal experiences. Our view of God 
is based on our personal experiences. So the question is, what led this third servant to have a distorted view of God? Well, one clue we find is in the parable. The parable doesn't really say, but one clue is there. The servant received only one talent. He probably thought about the other two and that they had an advantage over him because they received more. It is easier to make a profit when you have more to invest, isn't it? It would have been easier to make a return if you had five talents instead of just one. So he felt that the master was unfair to him. And this is why he was upset with the master. He saw the master through a different lens because he thought, why did I get only one and the other guys got five and two? This master is unfair to me. You know what? This sounds like my children, actually. <laughs> and maybe your children. When they receive gifts, you know what happens? If you have two kids, if you have one, then you don't have that problem. But if you have two, you give them two gifts, pretty much exactly the same. But even if the color is different, one of them will inevitably say this infamous words, it's not fair. I wish I had the other one. <laughs> it happens all the time. This is how this servant was behaving, childish. It's not fair. Why did God, why did the master give me only one talent? Why this guy had five and this guy had two, I have only one. The root cause here is pride. This is the root cause of everything, pride. Being given fewer talents when others have been given more talents can appear unfair to a proud heart. Satan had the same problem in heaven. What was his problem in heaven? You remember what the problem was in heaven with Satan? Why can't I be like God? Why it was given them more? Why can't I be like God? Pride. And this is exactly what happens here with this servant. And pride stops us from serving God. Pride stops us from using what God gives us. Now, if you look at the story, it's very interesting. <laughs> you know, as I, I was putting myself in the shoe of the guy, in the shoes of the guy that received only two talents, right? The one that received five, he received the most. He probably should be happy. But listen, the guy that received two, he could, he could have complained as well, couldn't he? After all, he didn't receive five. And he just received only one more than the third guy. Do we find the guy complaining that received two? No, he faithfully went and with joy invested what the master gave him. Why? Because he had a proper view of who the master was. He had a personal trusting relationship with his master. He trusted him that the master knew what he was doing when he gave him two and not five talents. But the one that received only one talent could not take that. His pride was hurt. Our master does not want us to focus on the amount of our talents compared to others. We must remember that the church is not a talent show. The church is not Canada's God talent, okay? Where we come and perform and show off to exalt ourselves. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose is to glorify God with our talents. This is not a talent show here. The master treated all three the same. He gave his goods to all three of them. Did they deserve that? No. It was a gift. Even if it was five, two, or one, it still was a gift. You are still one talent richer than you were before. Because the master gave it to you as a gift. He treated all of them the same. So the problem was not with the master. The problem was with the servant. 
he misunderstood the master's intentions. Instead of focusing on the reason why he received the talent as a gift from the master, he focused on the amount. He completely missed the point. Now, the word to know in the Bible is experiential, as I already said. This means that this third servant never had a deep, close, personal relationship with his master. That's why he did not know who his master was. His experience was based on something else, not on love. And verse 25 tells us, if you go back to verse 25, he said, and I was what? Afraid. His experience with God was based on fear. Is that something good to base your experience with God? <laughs> no. There are so many Christians today that base their relationship with God on fear. Fear can be a great motivator, but not in spiritual things. God wants us to serve him out of love, not out of fear. Amen? So fear really keeps us from developing our talents. Fear is Satan's favorite tactic. Someone once said that Satan three, has three kinds of fear. Self-doubt, self-pity, and self-consciousness. Self-doubt says this, I could never do that. I'm not qualified. It's the fear of failure. Self-doubt, I always doubt yourself. Self-pity says this, I failed in the past so many times, I made an attempt at one time to get involved for God, to get involved in ministry and serve, but I got burned, so I'm not going to do it again. Oh, self-pity, I've done it, poor me. And the third one, self-consciousness, says this, what will other people think? <laughs> We always look for the approval of others instead of looking for the approval of whom? Of God. And thus we experience this fear, and Satan is happy for us to tremble in fear like this third servant and have a distorted view of God who is really just a God of love. And he wanted to serve him out of love. Our faithfulness in stewardship is a result of how we view God's character. If we are afraid of failure or afraid of God, we will not invest our money or time or talent into praising and glorifying God's name. Let me conclude with this. A pastor took uh, two of his nephews that were visiting him to church with him. And uh, these two nephews have never been in church before. That was their first time. There were two boys, six and nine, and it can be overwhelming the first time in church, especially for kids, right? So uh, the boys, for some reason, weren't very impressed with the service. <laughs> the younger one raised his hand in the middle of the children's story and asked the question, how much longer do we have to sit up here? <laughs> when the offering was passed, he watched as people put money in the plates, and when it finally got to him, he looked up at his aunt and he said, you mean to tell me we got to pay for this? <laughs> now, let me tell you this. I like bringing examples of kids because they're very honest in what they say, and they usually have a good point. If our image of God is like the unfaithful servant in the parable, then we are likely to approach giving with the same attitude as this boy. You mean to tell me I got to pay for this? Or you mean we have to invest in this? And if this is what you think, we are more likely to just bury our, our you know, talent away instead of using it for benefiting God's kingdom. But if we really truly know God and have a personal relationship with him, it's all about knowing him. It's all about knowing who your master is. If you truly know him, it will be a joy to invest your life 
into bringing glory to God. Amen? Amen. Investing everything you have into bringing glory to God. So in the parable of the talents, the two faithful servants received the praise, well done, my good and faithful servant. The one that did not receive the praise was the one that did not, didn't do anything with his talent. As I said in the beginning, the main principle of stewardship is that it all belongs to God to begin with. So stewardship is all about God's goodness and faithfulness to us. Amen? That's where it starts. So let me turn this a little bit around. So if stewardship is all about God's faithfulness to us, then the praise should go to whom? To God, not to the servants. Today we should be able to say, well done, Lord. Well done, Lord. You have been faithful to me in the past year. Because of your faithfulness to me, Lord, I will respond with being faithful to you. This is how I want you to think about stewardship. It's all about God's faithfulness. We just respond to God with our faithfulness to him. So we can say today, Lord, great is thy faithfulness. May God bless you. Amen.